Glorious Heavenly Father, thank you so, so, so much for bringing us together and giving us an opportunity to look into your word and to research it and to study it and to believe it, and to believe it in our hearts and to cherish it and not to fall away from it. Lord God, uh, we thank you that 67 years ago today, brave young men did the impossible and not to us, O oh Lord, not to us belongs the glory, but to your name when uh, they stormed uh, Normandy Beach and... Uh, what, a, what an accomplishment you wrought on our behalf. And we thank you for that. And uh, though we've fallen away in this nation from uh, the principles of that time, I ask that you humble us and uh, bring us back to you and to your glorious gospel once again. Lord God, we thank you for the blessings of this life. Thank you for the day. And may your name ever be praised. Amen. Amen. <coughs> uh, uh. So uh, let's see here. Are we still in Genesis? I, we're somewhere in Genesis. Before we do that, though, let's read a couple verses. I got something to, to a, a little study to do today, which pertains to one of the things I said in the prayer here. If uh, somebody would go to 1 Timothy 4, and then somebody else go to Romans 11. I got that one. Okay, and then somebody else go to 2 John 7. I get 2 John 7. Okay, somebody else go to 1 Timothy 1. Okay, you got it. And then uh, somebody go to 2 Timothy 11. So we got all, just all kinds of things going on here. Yeah, but, all over the place. Yeah. Anyway, when you get to 1 Timothy 4, let me know. Or whoever gets to whichever one. We don't have to take it in order. Okay, 2 John 7. Okay, 2 John 7. Go ahead and just... Uh, you know what I'm, I'm thinking? Yeah, 2 John is a... So 2 John dash 7. Yeah, okay. Go ahead and just start reading that and we'll stop whenever. Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver in the Antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring his teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares Excuse his me, wicked, work. wicked work. Okay, well, a lot, lot to go over in there, but just keep that there for now. And uh, whoever has 1 Timothy 4, who's there? Anybody? 1 Timothy 4? The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe in them. By those who believe and who know the truth. Okay, that's good. Uh, up to the part... Oh, absolutely. Well, up to the hot iron part is where I wanted to go today. A lot of that seems to point to Catholicism, but we'll just stop at the seared with the hot iron one. Okay, whoever has um, Romans 11, read verse 32, please. Maybe a little after that, we'll see. For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For he, for who has known the, the mind, mind of, of the Lord, Lord? Or who became his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through to him and to him are all, are things. all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Okay. Well, specifically verse 32, but the doxology was wonderful enough to just continue reading. Uh, let's see here. Uh, 1 Timothy 1 and read verse 18. Whoever. Uh, Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction in keeping with the practices once made about you. Wait a minute. The prof to continue with the prophecies once made about you, so that the fo following them you may fight the good fight. Keep going or stop? Yeah, keep going. Um, I, I, I Hold on to the faith and a good conscience. Hang on a sec. Maybe I want 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, 2, 1 18. Let me see. I think it might be, I might have typed that wrong. I did this real, yeah. Read 2 Timothy. Um, I'm sorry. I, boy, I, oh, no, no, that's right. 1 Timothy, 
Um, I, I do want somebody to go to 2 Timothy 2, but hang on one second here. We want to go to, um, I, I, I typed that wrong simply because I, uh, I was in a rush this morning, and um, I'm looking for the part about Hymenaeus, and uh, let me see here. I put 1 Timothy 1.18. Oh, yeah, yeah, 1 Timothy 1, that's right, 18 through 20. I, I don't know why I, I, I backed it up to 18, but go ahead and read that again. Okay. The whole yeah, 1, 18, 1, uh, 1, 8, 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 20. Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that, the, so that by following them you may fight the good fight, holding on to faith and a good conscience. Some have rejected these, and so have shipwrecked their faith. Among them are Hananias and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Okay, and one more. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, read 11. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, 11, and there might be 12 or something. Hang on, let me get there real quickly. 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13. If we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure hardship, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. Okay, now here we go. I, the reason why, does anybody see a, a pattern that I'm kind of getting today, what I'm looking at? Leaving the faith. Leaving the faith. Yeah. Departing from the faith. And the reason why, when we first started this class, some of you guys got this. Uh, let me see if I have one here so I can show you. And uh, it, there's a point I'm making about it because it was, it was as astonishing to me this morning as anything I could be. Anybody remember me handing these out, yes. the Bible wheel? That's, right. That's it. The guy that, uh, the guy that has the Bible wheel website has been for as long as I can remember, uh, going back to 2002 or three maybe, he has been 100% on target with Jesus, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He's proclaimed the majesty of the Lord, the uh, inspiration of Scripture. And uh, as I said, the one thing that I kind of faulted him with, if you remember, as I said, that he like makes jewelry out of the Bible wheel, and he's got a, a stained glass Bible wheel, and it, that kind of stuff is a little bit nonsense to me. We're not worshiping the Bible, we're worshiping Jesus, who gave us that. Now, having said that, I want to read what he has on the front of his site this morning, which I don't usually go and look at other people's sites, but one of my friends that also knows Richard uh, said he, he emailed me this morning, and it was like actually like being punched. It would be like, imagine, imagine Seth and Jared standing up next Sunday and reading this, okay? When I first discovered the Bible Wheel in 1995, I soon became convinced that it was di designed by God. My conception of God at that time was pretty much in line with the guy in the sky style, God of traditional Christian theism. I have since come to realize that I do not, indeed cannot, believe in that kind of God at all. I now identify myself as a non-theist, meaning non-God, and non-Christian. Oh, wow. Non, a non-theist and a non-Christian. But this led to a big problem. All the evidence for seemingly supernatural design of the Bible wheel remains valid. Despite all the changes in my understanding of God and Christianity, none of the basic conclusions about the Bible wheel have changed. So how do I explain its existence? Am I to understand how it came to be? After two years of seriously thinking about this, I think I'm starting to get a basic understanding. I'm beginning to understand that the Bible wheel is something like a collective dream image produced by our collective Cosmic consciousness. <coughs> the universe as a whole is like a dream in the mind of God. So he just denied the existence of God. Now he's saying it's a dream in the mind of God. So yeah. he's, he, there's something clearly wrong with him of which we are all parts. We're all part of God. Pantheism. Okay, which yeah. is why I talked about the nature of God so thoroughly in Genesis 1-1. We spent three hours talking about simply the nature of God because if you get into pantheism, it, it's self-refuting. And I went through that, and there's a reason why. It's because this is what happens when you misunderstand the nature of God. They are a natural product of our minds. And so 
is all reality, the natural product of the col co collective cosmic mind. And this strongly coheres with the insights of psycho psychologist Carl Jung, if you know who he is, <laughs> especially in light of his observation that many patients draw circular mandalas with crosses in them when they reach psychic unity. Yeah. This is extremely exciting possibility since we could be witnessing the birth of cosmic religion that will unite all humanity. The Bible wheel looks like a divine dream mandala representing the unity of all religions manifested by our unified collective cosmic consciences. I am just beginning to understand this. It seems to be the best solution since the concept of a personal God that intervenes in the world, a Zeus-style God, seems impossible to me for many reasons which I will be explaining in the future posts. Well, needless to say, I won't be reading his future posts. Yeah. And um, it, it, it is as thoroughly incomprehensible for me to have read that this morning as it is, as I said, for Seth and Jared to walk up there and say, we had a Bible study this past week and we decided that we have been presenting the wrong God. I would be that shocked at that after having read his analysis of the Bible over the past eight, nine years, whatever it's been. It's in, I've known him personally, we've emailed, we've had great discussions and all of a sudden this happened. So either he has had some type of moral affliction in his life a, a, or a mental affliction or possibly, you know, when I say moral affliction, I say something like maybe he had a daughter die that didn't know Christ and he just can't believe that his daughter isn't with Christ. Who knows? Who knows what the reason is for us? Maybe his wife is leaving him and he's just totally distraught by it. What's that? It, right, you don't, we have no idea. I, I, I went to email him this morning. For some reason, my email has dropped out. You know, normally Google stores all the emails you send to, and you start typing, it just puts it in there. He's not in there anymore. So, told me the Lord doesn't want me to email him at this point, but I was going to tell him I don't want to hear from you other than the fact that if you need prayer and it's something that is disturbing you, but even that I'm apparently not supposed to do because I've never seen Google lose anything out of my email box. But, um, uh, I, it is, to me, it's astonishingly unbelievable, but it matches some of the verses we read, uh -huh. which are that there were deceivers that were never among us, and, you know, and some of them, uh, uh, the one that I read from Romans, if you still have that in front of you, read that again, Romans, I think it was 34, just verse 34. Okay. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who became his counselor? Uh, is that the one that I, it was, it was, uh, I'm sorry, 1132, I'm sorry, read that. Yep. For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. Okay, it's possible that this guy is just having a, a crisis in life and God has shut him up in disobedience so that he can show greater mercy on him later. I don't know. And then the reason why I chose, this is a faithful saying, it, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. Okay, that right there is eternal salvation. If we died in Christ, as Paul speaks throughout his writings, when we call on Jesus Christ, we die to sin. That's it. We are eternally saved and we shall also live with him. It says if we endure, we shall also reign with him. But then it says if we deny him, he will deny us. Is this person denying him in the immediate context? Yes. But if he is called on Jesus as Lord and Savior, I believe what Paul is speaking about based on everything else that Paul writes in his writings. He's talking about people that deny Jesus completely and entirely without ever calling on him. And the reason why is verse 13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. In other words, if this person, this Richard that wrote the Bible Wheel website, if he called on Jesus and he has now had some type of departure for whatever reason, he is still, Jesus Christ is still going to be faithful to him and his salvation. I believe in eternal salvation. I cannot preach that this person was saved and is now not saved. But I can't know if he was ever truly saved. There's a difference. So I, I bring up that verse particularly for that reason. But uh, uh, I, I, it, this does not dismiss his work either. I wouldn't recommend anybody go to a site anymore. I never will. As a matter of fact, I deleted my entire links page today from my website because I just don't want to have people that are doing this kind of thing suddenly pop up and people go to there. So I have no links page at all on my website. But uh, I was just going to delete him and I decided to just delete them all. But this doesn't dismiss his work. His work 
is still valid. God uses bad people to make uh, uh, good results. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, I have no idea what this guy's status is. I don't know if he's going to come back to the fold or if he's not going to come back to the fold. 